Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Sarah Siegel, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Claudio Lomnitz discussing his latest book, Nuestra America, My Family and the Vertigo of Translation. He's joined in conversation tonight by Jesus R. Velasco. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events here on Zoom. And as always, our event schedule appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk today, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many as time allows. If you would like to buy a copy of Nuestra America, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase it. All sales for this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you for your support of community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link to donate in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Now, I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers, and I've already warned them that I might butcher some Spanish, so please bear with me. Claudio Lomnitz is an anthropologist, historian, and critic who works broadly on Latin American culture and politics. He is professor of anthropology at Columbia University. Lomnitz's books include Death and the Idea of Mexico and the Return of Comrade Ricardo Flores Magón, among many others. As a regular columnist in the Mexico City paper La Jornada and an award-winning dramaturgist, he is committed to bringing historical and anthropolog anthropological understanding into public debate. He is joined tonight by Jesus R. Velasco. Jesus studies medieval and early modern legal cultures across the Mediterranean basin and Europe within and outside the legal professions from the perspective of contemporary critical thought. He is the author of Dead Voice, Law, Philosophy, and Fiction in the Iberian Middle Ages, An Order and Chivalry, Knighthood and Citizenship in Late Medieval Castile. His articles on legal culture, chivalry, Occitan poetry, political theory, and other subjects have appeared in journals like MLN, La Coronica, Studi Hispanici, and many others. He is currently a professor of Spanish at Yale University. Today, they are discussing Nuestra America. In Nuestra America, Claudio Lomnitz traces his grandparents' exile from Eastern Europe to South America. At the same time, the book is a pretext to explain and analyze the worldview, culture, and spirit of countries such as Peru, Colombia, and Chile from the perspective of educated Jewish emigrants imbued with the hope and determination typical of those who escaped Europe in the 1920s. Michael Greenberg writes, we're all familiar with the memoir that brings a dissolving old family snapshot to life. Lomnitz combines that snapshot with a panoramic picture of Spanish America and Europe from the 19th century to present time. The real treat of this extraordinary book is Lomnitz's acute lucidity and intelligence. Without further ado, I will turn things over to our speakers. Claudio, Jesus, the virtual podium is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, so I now only see Claudio here. Hello, Claudio, how are you? And thank you all for, for coming to this event. Um, when Claudio Lomnitz first told me about his book, uh, he said, well, I am writing a very interesting book in which I am going to tell the story of how I achieved monolingualism. And it was, it was, it was a, a funny thing to say, and, and Claudio is very funny always, but it was also a, an incredible deep thing to say. How, in fact, a family that had, that was fluent in five different languages was uh, so itself forced to leave different spaces in the uh, in Eastern Europe to go to South America and then build a completely different life. 
this is just a very uh, thin idea of what the book is about. I'd say that if we talk about this book, the correct sentence is not that Claudio Lomnitz wrote this book. Lots of people write books. In the Med Middle Ages, to write a book meant that somebody had undergone the tiresome task of copying a book that already existed in some form, paper, parchment, wax tablets, etc. The Latin verb scribes used to refer to those who had actually created the book was facere, to make. So as in some medieval objects or manuscripts, the book, the book could say in the first person, Claudio me fecit. That's what the book would say. Claudio made me. Still, the sentence would be both accurate and not completely satisfactory. Maybe it would be better if Cla Claudio himself uttered Liber hoc me fecit. This book made me. Both could claim the same. And then we would see what this book really is, a conversation between the book and Claudio about who made whom or about how they made each other. This mutual making seems important to me when I read the book. Frequently, I realize how present is the voice of the narrator. I enjoy this presence because this is a perplexed narrator. That is one who has devised a project only to realize that the web, web of crisscrossing elements was nothing like the one he expected. Therefore, instead of presenting the conclusions, he is rather sharing his perplexity with the reader. They are at the same time working together to answer the same questions that the narrator, of course, is able to formulate in a more detailed way as he has access to an archive that takes shape also in front of oneself on top of the very pages, just naturally popping up from the interior world of the book. I would say probably that this is uh, an archive that is endless, as if I remember well, parts of it are still arriving by mail to Claudio's home, even from Australia. Having access to the archive is also an inaccurate expression. The pieces that now constitute an archive were before just pieces of paper, letters, memoirs, photographies, or remembrances from experiences or from doubt or from uncertainty. Claudio did not even know that many of them existed. He became aware of that while writing the book, as the book asked him to make him out of some of those pieces. Now, talk to your mother. Now talk to your uncle. Now talk with the dead, not through what they wrote, but through what somebody else wrote about the space they might have shared around the same era. And now the book said, dig deep into your own memory, into what you know, the relics of language, body countenance, gestures from your own past, a past that did not have a presence until you summoned it up for, for this particular thing that is me, that is the book you are writing, the book that you are going to read. Many of those pieces, they are not just disjecta membra because there was not a body they belonged to other than an ideal uh, body of knowledge, maybe. Many of those pieces, I was saying, were also conceived and written in some of the languages the maker of the book had forgotten during the last two generations of his family. Then he tries to catch up with some, miss some, remember words in some of them, or deploy a host of translators to help him understand books, articles, inscriptions, letters in Yiddish, Russian, Hungarian, Romanian, some of those languages that belong to his family at a certain point. A book that asks a lot from its maker and the maker that does not shy away when the book asks, but rather enters the contest. A poet like the maker of this book, yes, like Claudio himself, a Chilean poet, Vicente Huidobro, because 
as you know, Claudio was born in Chile, wrote this when he declared independence from nature. Non serviam. I won't be your slave, Mother Nature. I will be your master. You will use me, that's fine. I don't want and I can't avoid it, but I will also use you. I will have my own trees that won't be like yours. I will have my mountains. I will have my, I will have my rivers and my oceans. I will have my sky and my stars. Now replace nature, mother nature, with history. When history seems to have established its own rules, its own method, its own way of writing books, Claudio says that, non serviam, I will not serve this set of rules because the history I want to write cannot be written with them. This book is also a theory of history. If it puts the family as the center of that theory of history, it's not just because Claudio is an anthropologist. It is not just because he has invaded, he was invaded by unbearable nostalgia. It is not just because he has suffered the loss of members of his family. It is not just because, it is as well, because the family as a random dynamic of people linked by consanguinity and affinity, that is not as an institution, because institutions are elective, optional instructors, is an impossible actor of historical events. They are unpredictable. The family wander around intimacy and distance. They cannot judge why being such perfect strangers, they are so much alike. And sometimes they cannot affirm where they belong. Claudio's mother, Larissa, born in France to Jewish Romanian parents, did not have a citizenship, as the book tells us. Citizenship and family in this history, in this theory of history, are not something anybody can take for granted. They are the product of hard labor. And this is the labor Claudio and the book strive for. Claudio always claims to be a chilengo, a chilango, sure, as we call the Mexicans, but born in Chile. Only in 2017, he got to receive Mexican citizenship, less than one year after losing his father, the seismologist Sina Lomnitz. The book claims to be the history of Claudio's maternal family, Misha Adler and Noemi Milstein. Sina makes his appearance at the beginning and at the end of the book. But this has always been interesting to me because one day, sometime after July 2016, much before Claudio started writing this book, Claudio told me during one of our breakfasts that he had found an autobiography of his father, Sina. He had been reading it and came up with the idea of writing something about it, a book maybe. In lieu of that memoir from his father, Claudio gives us a few memories of himself that summarize very well his own task and his, uh, and his theory of history based on search and surprise. Both come at the end of the book. In one of them, Claudio explains how freshly arrived to Berkeley, Sina takes them to some place near Walnut Creek where they can practice a few archeological searches. We would, we would have been happy if we had found there the fossil or some clam, but of some clam, but we came up with a surprisingly bigger finding, the remnants of a prehistoric horse, a mesohippus, they spend hours, days cleaning it up and learning about the evolution of the horse. It was unexpected. And as Claudio remembers, part of a random form of curiosity that accompanied him all his life. The second remembrance is almost at the end of the book. Very similarly, when they arrived to Mexico after their time in Berkeley, the three brothers, Claudio and Alberto, Jorge Claudio and Alberto, enroll in a class of entomology. This is how we got to know Tepotzlan, a place we fell in love with. We went across the valley, turning each cow excrement. They were looking for an Egyptian scarab, the Phaneus. He remembers that with detail, a sublime space and searching the sublime in shit, a double pleasure for any child. Thank you.
This is a, a short text uh, I wanted to write about Nuestra America, a book that has accompanied me as a reader and as a friend of Claudio for a few years now, including, of course, this the highly anticipated translation in English. And I've always had many questions for, for Claudio because we have, we have been in conversation about the book many, many different times. But the one question I would like to start with is, I would say that the structure that is at the center of almost all your research, Claudio, is the family. What changes when the anthropologist and the historian that is interested in talking about the family suddenly, or not that suddenly, talks about his own family? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus, first of all. Thank you for that uh, beautiful text uh, and so thought provoking for me. And thank you always for your company and friendship through the process of writing this book. It's been very important for me. Uh, <clears throat> and this is uh, a very moving, moving moment because um, I wrote this book twice, the first time in Spanish, and then I rewrote it completely um, for this uh, English version that has just been published this week. And so I'm delighted to celebrate its, its appearance here with you and with, with all of you. Thank you. Thank you for, for joining me tonight or for joining us tonight. Um, that's uh, your question about family uh, in, and writing about my own family versus thinking about family more, more broadly is, is, uh, is, is a hard one for me to answer, to be honest, because <clears throat> I think that in the, 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 this book was, was triggered uh, in, in a moment and a period that was quite anxious for me with regard to my family. So it was the springs of, uh, for writing this book um, <clears throat> were quite intimate and actually um, the book was was written in a context that I felt was a dangerous context uh, for for humanity and for even for my family. And uh, is so in some way reaching back to uh, to my grandparents. The the book is to a large extent the the, the story of my maternal and also my paternal grandparents and maybe my parents and <clears throat> on either side. Um, was in part uh, a way of thinking about uh, the decisions that they'd made and thinking through the decisions that they'd made, uh, trying to understand them. And this is a very uh, personal thing and it's not very oriented uh, to the institution of the family. As you said in your, in your remarks, actually, the, the book is not really very oriented <clears throat> to the institution, even though it might shed light on the institution. It's more of a selfish thing uh, in the sense that <clears throat> I think that we don't really understand very well um, I, the, the processes that have made us possible. For instance, um, the, re the relationship between a, a, a family members protecting other family members from information. So a deliberate process of forgetting or of distortion, which I discovered plenty of in the case of my, my family history, um, is sitting alongside the, reprodu the transgenerational reproduction of um, <clears throat> both of trauma, uh, but also of, uh, you know, of a sort of joie de vivre, um, desire, etc. So how does that happen? I, I, I don't know. And I think that um, this book is an inquiry into that kind of problem, which is somewhat different from the more political political history or e cultural history that I've written elsewhere, for instance, in my book about death or about uh, in the Mex you know, revolution. <clears throat> mm -hmm. No, that's fascinating. So one, one of the things that, that maybe um, also, our, our audience would like to know is 
this is how you came up with this book, this moment that you talk about, this moment of uncertainty, this moment of danger. Um, and there is also the danger of the materials you were working with. So how labile, how fragile are they? And how they keep coming up. It's an, it's an, an, it's an endless or bottomless kind of archive. Tell us a little bit. Where yes. all these materials come from? How do they arrive to your to your desk? What do you do with them? What kind of new research uh, do they elicit that have you just talking to other people, even members of your family that you didn't know at the mm -hmm. time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as you said, in, uh, again, in your remarks, this book starts off with a meditation on language, on my own language, or lack of language, what I called my alingualism. Um, <clears throat> because um, it's not a book that could be written responsibly by an academic. Um, uh, an academic has to uh, know, for instance, the languages that, of the people that he's writing about. And in my case, that would have meant knowing four additional languages to the ones that I, that I speak, um, which I didn't have, and I didn't have time to learn them, and I wouldn't have learned them anyhow. Uh, and so I decided to write the book nonetheless. And so that, that already, that, that means from the start that there's a tense relationship with the, histori the historian's craft, which is something that I, that I do have because I, I was a professor of history for many years. Um, but uh, I, mean, you know, I was very conscious that I, couldn't, I could only use some of those. And um, the book in that sense and the archive uh, is as you say, fragile, but it's not just fragile, it's highly performative in the sense that it's a book that relies, um, I, I put it in the book at some point, uh, like Blanche Dubois, on the kindness of strangers, uh, because uh, uh, many of the documents came to me thanks to finding allies in countries uh, and places that, uh, <clears throat> that I couldn't really, uh, where I couldn't really have reached them, uh, for instance, um, a part of the story of my great grandparents and grandparents in Colombia in the 1930s and 40s. Um, my, my great grandfather settled in a, in a small city called Tulua in the Valle del Cauca in Colombia. <clears throat> and uh, many of the documents that I found there were thanks to a, a writer from Tulua, Gustavo Alvarez Garcia Sabal, who I had never met. Um, who was, I was put in touch with thank, by another friend, Colombian friend who, who wrote to him. And he did interviews for me and sent me all kinds of documents. Um, documents that I have on the uh, assassination of my paternal uh, great grandfather in, in Mannheim in Germany. Um, many of those came to me again through uh, uh, Karen Strobel, uh, uh, an archivist in Mannheim, the city of Mannheim, who found out that I was uh, Sina Aronsfrau's great grandson and, who I, and that I'd been writing about it. And she sent me a treasure trove of documents. So part of the, the documentary effort involved a level of collaboration, but also a level of um, friendship, I would say, on the part of the people. Uh, helping me with the documents that I didn't expect. And in, in that sense, I think you're right to say that the book made me <laughs> insofar as uh, in, some, in some way, there's a collective uh, dimension to the archive that is in this book. It's fantastic because in a certain way, then all come, like all three elements of more classical anthropology come together in this book on the one, but, but in a different way or in different ways as you would expect family as the center of the, of the book and then kinship and friendship as the purveyors of, of materials for you to, to mull on, to think of and to work with. Uh, but um, let's, let's we, I, I, I want you to talk later, that will be the next question, but I want you to prepare for that about the assassination of your great grandfather in Mannheim, because that's a very important um, piece of history that is also like tattooed in the history of your family. And that plays a bigger role in the book than, 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 than one would imagine after reading the book. 
Uh, but 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 let's for a, for a second focus on perhaps the main character in in this in this book, which is Misha Adler, uh, and and uh, your grandfather, and um, and and who is in a certain way the motor of history. And uh, it's it's I, I I never met him, of course, but I love him. And why I love him because for many different reasons. One of them is because of your grandfather, but the other reasons is because through Misha Adler, you can actually build a piece of history that would be uh, obscured or um, or and an, an available for many of us. Tell us a little bit how Misha Adler is that kind of model of history, the kind of things that that working about his life and his deeds unveiled through your book. Thanks, I, I, I agree with that, 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 <clears throat> that there, there's a lot that I learned uh, through in, in thinking about uh, my, this particular person, uh, my, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather. In, in part, it's interesting, the question is interesting in part because my maternal grandfather is not someone who uh, um, <clears throat> became very famous. He was someone who uh, was exiled multiple times. He was born in a town called Nova Sulitsa, uh, which when he was born was part of, in 1905, was part of the Russian empire. But when he emigrated to Peru, which is in 1923, um, it was already part of Romania. Then later it was, went to the Soviet Union and it, it is now part of the Ukraine but it was historically part of Bessarabia. <clears throat> um, and the town that he was from was a border town. Uh, when he was born, half of this, the town was crossed by an international border between Russia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So half of Noa Sulica was on the Russian side, that's where he was born, and half of it was on the Austro-Hungarian side. And his family was from the Austro-Hungarian side, so German speakers as well as Yiddish speakers and Russian speakers, of course, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> but they had settled in the end on, in, uh, on the Russian side of the border. So there's a first, first interesting thing about him and also about my grandmother who comes from a nearby town in Ukraine, Mohilev, um, <clears throat> is that they're sort of small, small town cosmopolitans from the start. This is a first interesting thing. So when he arrives to Lima, my, my grandparents met in Lima, they, they, they emigrated separately. When, when he arrives in Lima, he becomes part of the circle of a, a very famous uh, person for Latin Americans, for Latin Americans, Jose Carlos Mariategui, uh, <clears throat> a Marxist uh, who died very young, uh, who died in 1930. Um, but he was one of Latin America's great lights and also the founder of a, a vanguardist um, a journal called Amauta, which means teacher in Quechua. And uh, this journal Amauta is one considered one of the two or three most important vanguardist uh, journals in, in, of Latin America. And, uh, um, and it has this combination between wanting to reform a Peruvian consciousness with a deeply cosmopolitan internationalist uh, agenda that was in part consonant with the communism of, of uh, Mariategui and also my grandfather. Uh, so my, my grandfather starts, uh, uh, strikes up a, a, a friendship, a close friendship with Mariategui, translated for the journal, et cetera. And one of the things that I discover in the book and looking, trying to figure out this friendship and how it was that these people, why they became so close, um, <clears throat> is that there's a quite a deep connection between Jewish, the Jewish, the one could say Jewish emancipation and the Jewish Renaissance, cultural Renaissance that you have uh, in the early 20th century, late 19th century already, um, <clears throat> with the kind of consciousness that we have in Latin America and in South America that's emerging in the 1920s, which is the revolutionary period for Latin America, bear in mind. So the 1920s is the time when you have Latin American modernism being invented, Latin American, the Latin American left is created, the connect, connection between the indigenous society and national society is reformulated. Mariategui is a core figure of that. 
And one of the things that I explore that I don't think was known before uh, the writing of this book is the connection between Jewish history and this particular form of Latin American vanguardism. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that with the same typesets and, and, and printing techniques of Amauta, Misha and Noemi uh, created the uh, Anuario, what, what, what is the-, the uh, Repertorio Hebreo. Repertorio Hebreo, yeah. <laughs> I didn't, it didn't come to, to mind immediately. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that in, and that they even, uh, uh, they even had Sigmund Freud write a letter for them that mm -hmm. was, was it published in the, in the first issue of, in the first and only issue. The, sec the second issue. <laughs> the second issue of Repertorio Hebreo. So, so this is this is uh, one one of the elements that we don't know. We we didn't know either that Mish Tadler was the first person to write a te a thesis, a doctoral dissertation on Marx in the in 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 Latin America. Is that right? Well, certainly in Peru, possibly Peru. in Latin America. I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And but but there are there are many other things that 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 um, Misha Adler did or did not do. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, one of the elements that I enjoy very much uh, about this, this book that I have read many times, both in Spanish and in English, is uh, what we know about the economy of exchange and commerce and trade at a very small scale, but bigger scale, uh, of what they call the clappers, so peddlers, um, because not because Misha did it, but because because Misha refused to do it. <laughs> and then you tell the story of what he didn't do. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, uh, my my grandfather arrived with a, a sh with a ship in a ship where with a with a bunch of uh, kids more or less his age, eighteen, nineteen, uh, from Romania, and they were fleeing a military draft that was happening that was targeting <clears throat> it was targeting a lot of people, but it was certainly targeting Jewish youth in Bessarabia. Bessarabia had recently been incorporated to Romania. Romanians were very anxious about Bessarabia's loyal, national loyalties or lack thereof, uh, because they perceived Bessarabia as being more oriented to Russia than because they, Bessarabia had belonged to the Russian Empire for about 100 years. And so, um, and to the Ottoman Empire before that. Uh, but <clears throat> so, um, uh, so the Romanians are anxious and they're targeting uh, the Jewish youth of these towns uh, quite a lot. So they're, they're fleeing from the draft. So he arrives with a shipload of friends and those friends, uh, all of them, to my knowledge, uh, became these what they called uh, clappers in Yiddish, which were door-to-door -door salesmen uh, who, if, for Latin America, um, inaugurated kind of a sale on door-to-door -door sale on credit. They sold the shmates, they sold clothes. Uh, just like uh, the uh, em immigrants from the Middle East uh, uh, did, who arrived in those a little bit earlier in the 19th, during the First World War, 1915, 18, both Jewish and uh, Christian and Muslim peddlers. Um, so these were these were the inventors of uh, sale on credit, and this sale on credit meant that these folks, first of all, they knew the countries in South America very deeply because they had to, they sold in small towns and in medium sized towns. And they, they formed a network where the was connected to the wholesalers who are usually in the main cities like Lima or Bogota, right? Or Caracas, whatever. But, <clears throat> but they knew that they, they came to know the geography and the country, even though they often spoke Spanish very broken or with a strong Yiddish accent, my grandfather, rest in peace, uh, spoke Spanish very, very well, wrote Spanish very well, but always with a thick Yiddish accent. In, <clears throat> in, and so you have this kind of interesting thing where this, the consciousness of the intelligentsia in the capital cities of, of Latin America, and most particularly of a country like Peru, that had this tense relationship between the capital and the indigenous population that 
in the countryside, which constituted 80% of the population, by the way, um, uh, you, had a, you had an intelligentsia that didn't really know the country that well at a certain level. They knew it very well, of course, they, they dominated it, they had dominated it for years. But it's not the same than these clappers who were knocking door to door, looking inside the houses of people, selling them maybe a jacket or a suit that might allow a, a worker to pass himself off as a member of the middle class. Uh, this, this, it's in this, this kind of cusp that these clappers uh, operated. So there's a way in which people like my grandfather um, had a double entry into the local society. One, through his studies in the university, he studied college and he got his PhD in, in, in Lima, in philosophy, but at the same time, also this kind of more um, hard-grained, uh, very practical view of what it is that people wanted and what it is that people were doing. Mm -hmm. So um, very soon we are going to be to move to the, the 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 questions from our audience, and I already have one that is ex absolutely fantastic. But before that, I want you to focus a little bit on this story of the assassination of your great grandfather in Mannheim and the myths around it and how you tell it and what is its role in the history of in the vertigo of telling the story of your family, the history of your family? Mm -hmm. Well, um, as you said, most of this book focuses on my maternal family and on my maternal grandparents. Um, but <clears throat> the start of the book and the last portion of the book is dedicated to my father and to his family. And I think that the question of my father was always either in the front of my mind or in the back of my mind in the writing of this book. <clears throat> my father uh, was a very self-effacing person at a certain level. Um, I, um, one of the things that I discover through the problem of the assassination of his grandfather, who was murdered two years before my father was born, um, <clears throat> is that on this, there's a strong uh, horror of envy uh, that, that, that is transmitted through this story. And um, my father was, who, who never found out exactly the story of the assassination of his grand grandfather. He knew he had been murdered, but he had been uh, misinformed about the nature of that assassination. Um, but he did, he did know, he was taught uh, that, uh, you know, to, to dread envy. And so my father, as I said, was, was self-effacing and uh, was someone who I would say was it was a well-known scientist, very well-known scientist, but, um, <clears throat> but, but at the same time, um, someone who uh, um, was quite humble and tended um, to deflect uh, attention from himself. Um, my father's name was Sinna, C-I-N-N-A, and uh, we were always told, he was told, that it was a traditional family name. <clears throat> Um, but it's an odd traditional family name, if you think about it. First of all, there is Sina and Julius Caesar, you know, this is a secondary character. <laughs> um, <clears throat> why would this be a particularly a family name? And looking at, you know, reconstructing the genealogy, I found that it was not a family name, but his grandfather was Sina, S-I-N-A, or Sinai also, sign like, um, uh, Aaron's father, his mother's father. And he had been uh, murdered um, in Mannheim in 1922. And uh, in, or, yeah, 1922, 1923. My, my father was born in 1925. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the story as it emerged, because it, it took a long time uh, for me to figure it out and for me to figure it out, thanks also to the help of some friends, as I mentioned earlier, um, <clears throat> was that he was murdered by the Freikorps, the, 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 something called a organization consul, which were sort of like the heroes of the Nazis. Uh, he was murdered at the same, a few months after the, the creation of the Nazi party in Mannheim. 
the, 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 the local unit of the Nazi party. And um, <coughs> his assassins um, were two, uh, two of the people who were involved in his assassination were also involved uh, directly were the assassins of, of Walter Rathenau. And probably my audience here doesn't know Rathenau, but maybe they do if they're German. Uh, Rathenau was, a, was the minister, foreign minister in the Weimar Republic and was a secular Jew and he was murdered um, <clears throat> maybe a month or two after my great grandfather by the same people. Those same people had also murdered a couple of other very important political figures shortly before my grandfather, my great grandfather. So, the, the, so I, I thought at first maybe he was, well, why would they go after him? He's, was he as prominent as that? Because well, these people weren't, weren't going generally after small fry. They, they went after very big political targets. And in the middle of this, they, go, they, they, they kill my great grandfather. And the story uh, <clears throat> becomes one of sto a story really to a large degree of envy because it turned out that he was, my great grandfather was quite a successful wholesaler, um, but by no means absolutely mega rich. Let's say they, they, were, they were wealthy, um, but the important thing is that they had, he had emigrated to Mannheim from Poland. Um, and so as a result, he, he actually did well during the first world war. So he became sort of the, the classic, Side of hatred for like uh, folkish uh, anti Semites in, in post World War I Germany because he was like the foreign Jew, because he wasn't just Jewish, he was not German, the foreign Jew who did well during the war while the families like the Tillisons, who were his next door neighbors, who were <laughs> involved in his assassination in Rattenhouse. Um, were actually sort of downwardly mobile from the local upper class in, at that time. So um, the, the story brings out for me both questions to, questions to do with, with the envy, with self-effacement, self self but also in, in the attempt on the part of my grandmother in particular, but my grandparents to shield my father and his brother from that story. And oh, to me, that's important because on the one hand, I've discovered many continuities for me with that, but also <clears throat> it's important because one of the core mysteries to me as I wrote this book was how is it possible that coming up from such a screwed up story, I mean, there is so much suffering on either side in my family history. How is it possible that I had like such a cool or such a, such a happy childhood? Um, and in some way, the book is the homage to, to forgetting, um, and, but also it's also rather skeptical of the success of forgetting, I would say. Mm -hmm. I have uh, now uh, a few questions from our audience. Um, one of them, the first one you are going to, to, I mean, you are going to like them all, but the first one, uh, I think you're going to be um, responding it very happily. So the, I'm just reading what, what, what this anonymous attendee wrote. What was the process of writing the book first in Spanish, then in English? Is the English version a direct translation of the Spanish text, firstly? And secondly, how did you feel about the book as you watched it move between languages? And, and that is a great question. And <coughs> I wrote it first in Spanish because one of the things that I, that I say in the, in early on in the book when I'm talking about the problem, my problem of language, is that I, I speak uh, English and Spanish mainly. I speak French and Portuguese, but not that well. Uh, so I've always moved really between Spanish and English, although Spanish has been my, the language of my home. I learned English as a boy and I've, done, I've written books directly in English as well as in Spanish. <clears throat> um, so I, I, I thought that I should write this book 
in this la- in this language of the home. To me, um, I, I one of the things I say in the book is that there's uh, it's like Spanish is like my Yiddish, the language of the home. English is like my Esperanto, the the the, lang- the universal language. But I don't really feel completely at home in either one. I, that's what I call my alingualism. That I had to make do with with what I have, which is actually. Uh, is a story of linguistic dispossession, also of appropriation, but linguistic dispossession is very strong for me. And that's the language that I write in. It's the language of linguistic dispossession. Um, so I decided to write it first, it, to, to write it in Spanish. And I, I wasn't at all sure that I would find that, it, that, that, that there would be interest in, in this uh, in English. Um, but I was extremely fortunate uh, to find uh, my, my editor at, at Other Press and uh, its director, Judith Gurowicz, to whom I, I owe uh, a lot. And uh, she was fascinated by the book. I had asked uh, uh, for translation. I had uh, commissioned a translation, a very good translation of the Spanish text. She read that. Um, but it was clear that the book needed to be something else uh, for it to exist in English for a number of reasons. <clears throat> and so I rewrote it entirely. Um, and it, I would say that part of it is a translation of the original Spanish. And there's a lot that's new that didn't exist in Spanish in terms of content, uh, new, new, uh, new chapters with new archival materials and the like. But there's also a difference in voice. I think that. Um, <clears throat> First, um, the portions of the story that are South American stories uh, needed less analysis and less explanation in Spanish than they do in English. Because my grandfather might not have been that famous, but he and my grandmother both were intellectuals who were actually highly appreciated. And so they moved in circles of people who are very well known in South America and in Latin America and for, about whom I don't need to explain so much. Um, on the other hand, in Spanish, I needed to talk much more in much more detail about the Jewish history, which in Latin America tends to be less known than it is in English and in the US. So there were, there were some practical uh, issues that needed to be dealt with. Um, but I also think that <clears throat> um, the the narrator's voice changed a bit uh, mm-hmm. in, in from Spanish to English. Um, in some way, I uh, uh, I use the I more in English, and in, at the same time, I would say that English to me is a slightly more analytical language. And to me, at least, my English is more analytical, and my Spanish, I would say, is a little bit more poetic. And uh, there's a there's a tension there. Yes, um, if if I may say, if I intervene, because I've been from this um, from the very beginning, you know, in conversation with you about this book, I was very concerned about the translation in English. I would I remember very well when you told me I am going to 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 I am going to to ask somebody to translate this book. Uh, into English, and I say, well, but how are they going to translate, uh, uh, you know, the Bohen Bohin the murder? And how are they going to to translate your rhythm? How are they going to translate your wordplay? How are they going to translate the moment in which your father and your mother became become acquainted, and your father makes a joke that uh, I don't know. But then, uh, yeah, the, the 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 English version is absolutely fascinating. And solves all those the anxieties that I, I did have. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so a, it was another a, a lot of yeah. work. It was a yeah. lot of work. It did involve a deep rewriting. Yes. No. No. I I I know that you rewrote and mm-hmm. that you also actually wrote it completely new because mm-hmm. you also came up or become aware of of new materials, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, one another anonymous attendee. Uh, wants to know more about this. Uh, how did you go about researching your family's complex history? Were you mainly dealing with passed down oral hi- oral stories, or were there documents, diaries, letters, etc., left behind? 
Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I have the good fortune. I mean, although I'm an anthropologist, I have the good fortune of 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 have have having uh, <clears throat> real historians training, and that that helps a lot. Um, I started way before understanding that I would write this book many years ago. I, I, I did do taped interviews with my mother and with my uncles. Um, <clears throat> I thought I, I wanted those stories to, to exist. And so there was, there was a backdrop of, uh, of rather inten intensive uh, interviews um, that I knew before I envisioned exactly this book, but long before. So yes, there was stuff to do with memory. Um, there's also, um, there are also uh, family documents. Um, many of those uh, the, uh, appeared in a painstaking way. I, I, you know, I, 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 many of those appeared, some of them appeared after I, for example, after I published the book in Spanish, um, I came, uh, to, uh, I received uh, a number of documents uh, of the family that um, that I had, you know, I didn't know existed, but I had thought I had already knocked all the doors. But people looked again and found. In the my, my family moved around a lot, so I would say that the family arc and they moved around often in bad conditions, as exiles and like. Um, <clears throat> so that means that. There is no, you know, extreme wealth of like a, a huge treasure trove of, uh, of documents. The documents are much more fragile, much more fragmentary. Um, there's a letter here, an envelope there, um, a photo uh, somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> but if photos you, with people you had to identify. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, um, some of the <clears throat> most of them. Uh, you know, I, I procured and rather than had, I didn't have them in my possession. Um, I had never seen them, you know. Um, my, gra my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, uh, published a couple of journals, in a uh, journal in, in Lima that we already mentioned, and two different journals in, in Colombia, in Bogota. Um, <clears throat> so the, and there was that. Um, there's also archival work that is sometimes it's not coming from directly from my family, but um, for instance, uh, the Lima <clears throat> police records of uh, the expulsion of my grandfather's parents from uh, from Peru, which happened in 1930. They were he was my grandfather was imprisoned and and they were thrown out of Peru um, because of their friendship with Mariati, their communist leanings. Um, and uh, so those are those weren't in my family's possession, but you could find them in the archive, and I did find them in the archive thanks to again colleagues because I'm a historian. I have historian friends, and so uh, you know, uh, Cristobal Arjovin in this case, a, a Peruvian historian, found this material in 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 the Lima archives because I didn't have time or resources really to put myself in each one of the places where they had spent time, uh, they, they move around a lot. The end of the, this wonderful uh, book that's just come out, I mean, you know, has uh, uh, the editors uh, uh, published at the end a map of the movements just so people can visualize it. But there's a, <clears throat> there's a lot of movement. So um, you need to do a little bit of archival tracing and poking lots of places. And then there's also just a, a more general historical reconstruction that needs that you sometimes need to do in order to understand what what really is going on. Like for instance, for me, Nova Sulitza, the town um, in Bessarabia that my grandfather was from, <clears throat> I had oral tradition on that, but I then had to read about the history of Bessarabia. Um, some literature that there is on that Bessarabia in this in this period, um, I was able to find in one of the, the U.S. has such wonderful libraries, American universities, and the Library of Congress, and all that are just uh, you know a jewel in the world. And so I you know came across a book written in Yiddish uh, um, 
uh, about this town, town that was published in, in Tel Aviv in the 19, early 60s by someone whom my grandfather knew actually. And I, I got a little bit of resources to get uh, someone in, who's a Yiddish speaker uh, in Israel to, uh, to summarize the book for me and then to translate the, the bits that I found most important. So actually, um, in t just to an just answer more succinctly, uh, the, the family documents, first of all, need to be treated with a lot of care because you can get a lot more out of them than you would suspect. Um, close reading, um, asking people, and I, I found that I was able to get real treasures of family documents that I didn't expect. But it took a while, by the way, mm -hmm. and it's not yet over. Yeah. Uh, but that needs to be um, supplemented with other kind of work. Mm -hmm. So one could say that it takes a village to raise a book. <laughs> it takes a village, it takes a library. <laughs> <laughs> it, it takes a lifetime. <laughs> it takes a lot of stuff. Yeah, I know. So uh, another, uh, another question from uh, another person in our audience. Um, we would like to thank you for this amazing talk. And uh, this person has a question about the title, Our America, and was wondering if you could talk about the significance of the title to you. Were you thinking of the present moment when there are so many questions about American ownership, or was there an image of the past that you were considering, or maybe both? Thank you. Thank you for that, that wonderful question. There's both, actually. On the one hand, Nuestra America is a title. There, there have been a number of versions of Nuestra America as a title, the most famous of which is Jose Martí, his famous essay, uh, Nuestra America. Uh, so the term Nuestra America in Latin America tends to, 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 to use that Martí genealogy, um, and it tends to be referred to our America as opposed to the US. Um, uh, Spanish America, right, or Ibero-America, of, as opposed to Anglo-America, et cetera, that kind of usage. And my, the, the, the thing that I'm showing here that is that there's also, first of all, it, this is also a book about a Jewish America, a Jewish Latin America, and <clears throat> the role that a very minoritarian culture, because let's say, for instance, in Peru or in Colombia, at the time that my grandparents lived there, there were really just a handful of Jews. I mean, in, in, in Peru, there were maybe 2,000 Jews, 2,500 Jews. Uh, in Colombia, there were, you know, during, by the time of World War II, when more had come in, um, 4,000 Jews. So we're talking about very small numbers. <clears throat> Nevertheless, um, through the history of my grandparents and their connection to this van Latin American vanguardism, I think it starts becoming clear that there's a kind of confluence, there's a kind of discussion, debate that people like my grandparents were part of and that I myself have been a part of. So in part, it's an attempt to rethink Latin America rather than from its traditional storytelling, which is, involves basically two great roots or three great roots, depending on the country. So it's either in the case of Mexico, traditionally the Spanish and the indigenous roots, or in the case of lots of places, the Spanish, then the indigenous and the African roots. Um, it's recognizing that our America has actually been shaped and created through complicated stories of, of, of immigrations and immigrations that have often been either denied or sidelined a little bit. And that I think does connect deeply with the question of the US and, um, and the US is I think in, you know, in need of and is involved in a process of rethinking itself, what the US is and what the US is in connection to uh, the various our, uh, the various we's, the various collectivities that claim that have claimed and that do claim like i claim too um you know this these countries this land yeah but uh, and there's there is another thing here it's like this book is not only uh it's many things of course but it's not only a history of immigration or immigration it is a history of expulsions of many expulsions that are mm -hmm. tragical 
that sometimes become come come with with something terrifying like for instance the ignorance of what happened to the part of the family that stayed at the other side of the river for many decades mm -hmm. or the many expulsions of misha or the many different uh, techniques of expulsion that accompany the history of your family and maybe the history of many other families. Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> I think uh, one of the things that the book starts with, and maybe we should end here, yeah. is... Um, <laughs> Sarah, Sarah has come yeah. up. <laughs> um, say, yeah, this is... and, may, may, and maybe we should end here is that <clears throat> uh, the, 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 the immigrant is in, the way, in, in some way the person who is used to try to endorse normalcy. Normalcy can't really justify itself because normality is very often a lot worse than one would like. So we're harder to justify, right? Full of problems. So the foreigner, the outsider, and it's a little bit like classic uh, essays on the foreigner and the outsider, Zimmel, et cetera. And the outsider, the, the stranger, is in some way um, a gaze that is needed to justify normality, but it also subverts it. Thank you so much, Claudio. I hate to end this discussion, but we are past eight o'clock. So um, I would like to thank Claudio and Jesus again for their time discussing these fascinating topics that span countries, languages, and many years that we could talk about for much longer. Um, and thank you all for tuning in and showing up for authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. If you would like to support Claudia on the bookstore, click the link in the chat to purchase Nuestra America. We sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good Thank night. You.